paper, a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dim night, and you tell me that you're pleasing that I never.
finished up our study of Ephesians just a couple of months ago. We started another study of another book of the Bible in a few weeks, but uh, during this period in the summer, uh, it's hard for me to cherry pick because we do go through books of the Bible, and I do that for a reason, to keep me honest, to look at the things that we don't underline as well as the things that we do. But uh, the next few weeks, we're going to take a look at some of the very important teachings of Jesus, some of the very important stories about Jesus' life, and then we'll get on with a uh, verse-by-verse study of another book. This morning, we're going to do uh, start a two-part study this morning and next Sunday morning on the subject of the Beatitudes. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus starts it out in chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew with the Beatitude, nine character traits that we as Christians ought to strive for, ought to have in our lives. We'll talk about that in just a moment, finish up next Sunday morning, but as always, before we talk about the Son, let's bow our heads and hearts and let's talk to His Father first. Father, we come before you this morning so grateful and thankful that you are a loving and perfect Father, the example for all of us who are fathers. We thank you for unconditional, undying love. We thank you that you're not just a father who is a figurehead, but you're involved in every aspect of our lives. You know us. You know the things that we brought in here that we wouldn't tell even if we had to. The things that make us blush in private. The sin, the dirt is a part of our lives, and, and yet you love us. We love our kids when they mess up, and you love us even more, and we're really messed up. So we thank you for that perfect love and how it models for us how to turn and love our kids. We come this morning to study your word. We thank you for this book. We ask you to come in a powerful way as we open his pages. Father, we pray for the one who teaches that you would forgive him his sins, for they are many. We come to this place this morning to see Jesus of Nazareth in him only. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus gets ready for the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. When we go to Israel, those of you who are going, you'll see this place. His back was to the sea. He was looking up at this mountainside. And it winds around, kind of in a semicircle. It goes up very, very high. There's a church up on top. Uh, the Church of the Beatitudes, a beautiful octagon church up there. And it's a, a natural amphitheater. And it says here that he sat down. When a rabbi had something important to say, he sat down. When we have something important to say, get up in front of a group of people, we stand up. It's just the opposite. Back in the first century, the rabbi sat down when he was going to say something important. And he sat down, it says, to teach his disciples, to teach the twelve. But thousands gathered around to hear what he had to say. Let's take a look at the scripture. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. For they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful. For they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Beatitudes. Not another set of commandments or laws to live by, but a list of character traits that a Christian ought to have. A list of character traits that a Christian ought to strive for. As we look at these nine codes of character for this Sunday morning, five next Sunday morning, after each one of them, you see the word blessed. And then you will find nine character descriptions of our model, Jesus of Nazareth. In just a moment, we're going to study the first four this morning. But before we do that, there are two sore thumbs that stick out of this text that we need to take a look at on the front end. 
Short of number one. You need to know that all of the Beatitudes find their parallel in the Old Testament. Jesus didn't teach anything new in the Beatitudes. Everything that he says, he's already said in the Old Testament. Let me say it again. Jesus didn't teach anything new in the Beatitudes. Everything he says is in the Old Testament. Does that surprise you? Well, it shouldn't. Maybe you have a red letter Bible with the words of Jesus in red. I do. And if you do, you need to underline the rest of it in red too. Because Jesus said that also. John 1.1 1, 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the creative Word of God. He was the living Word of God, who wrote the written Word of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word, Jesus Christ, wrote Genesis. He wrote Jeremiah. He wrote Revelation. And the Word was also the Word of God incarnate in the Son of God. One thing we need to realize is that God isn't schizophrenic. The New Testament isn't His only book. The Old Testament or the Older Testament is also God's Word. And the Word Jesus wrote that too. Jesus was not primarily a new teacher. He was the one who wrote the book, showing up in time and space, who came to teach us what it was all about. There's a story about a good old boy from the mountains of North Carolina. His name was Buford, and he was running moonshine. And the revenuers were on to him, so they set up an ambush. One day, a high-speed chase ensued, and they finally got him pulled over. And the federal agent walked up to the car, stuck his head in the back, and he, he said, Buford, what's in those jars in the back seat? Buford said, well, that's just water in those jars. He said, well, you don't mind if I take a sip, do you? He said, no, it's pure H2O. So the federal agent reached in, picked up one of the jars, took the lid off and took a sip, spit it out, and he said, Buford, that's 100% moonshine. And Buford said, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Praise God, the good Lord done went and did it again. <laughs> but let me tell you something. The New Testament is where the good Lord done went and did it again. Jesus is not a new teacher. He is a teacher, a rabbi, in the tradition that goes back to Abraham and Moses, reiterating everything in the Old Testament that he's already given us. You know, in college, when I got in the final two years into my major, we had courses that I really wanted to learn. And I wish that we could have sat under the author of the books that we were studying. We had, had a textbook, had a professor, but the professor hadn't written the book. And I thought, man, if we could just get the guy in here who wrote this book so that we could catch the spirit of the one who had written it. That's what Jesus did. The professor entered time and space to teach us his book in a way that we could understand it. All right, so we're number two. I want you to please note that the Beatitudes are constructed so that they have a present reality and a future hope. They state a present reality and then a promise a future hope. In the Beatitudes, Jesus says, Blessed or happy are you right now, present reality. For you will be or shall be, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the future hope. What's that say? Well, it says that if you're a Christian, He didn't promise you a picnic. It says that if you're a Christian, He didn't promise that there'd be no pain. It says that if you're a Christian, He didn't promise exemption from tragedy. What He promised was heaven and that you're going to last forever. I told you before about living in Chicago, making more money than I ever thought anybody made. Coming home to a brand new home, overlooking a golf course full of all new furniture, two new cars in the garage. We had it made. We had it all. And I remember sitting down at night before I went to bed and crying like a baby because my life was so meaningless and so empty. That was the present reality. Jesus changed all of that, and I realized the present reality was preparation for a future hope. A future hope that all of us have. An address in eternity. All right, those two appetizers out of the way on the main course for this morning, the be happy attitudes. We need to remember as we start that this is not a set of laws and rules and regulations, not the Ten Commandments. 
is a code of Christian character. I read the other day a definition of a philosopher. A philosopher is a person who talks about things you don't understand and then makes you feel guilty about. <laughs> I love that because that's pretty true. Philosopher, a person who talks about things you don't understand and then makes you feel guilty about it. But Jesus doesn't do that. And as we go through the Beatitudes, if you end up feeling guilty, you simply haven't understood the teaching. This is your measurement of the characteristics of Jesus that God is putting in your life as you grow. Someday you're going to be like Jesus. Not in this lifetime. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. But the Beatitudes are the yardstick that measures the process that we're in. As God changes us for the good. There's a story about a woman who went to her lawyer to get a divorce. And he said, what are your grounds for divorce? And she said, oh, about an acre and a half. <laughs> he said, no, no, no. Uh, what's your grudge against him? He said, we don't have a garage. We have a carport. He said, no, 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 no. Does he beat you up? She said, no, I usually get up before he does. <laughs> and he said, man, divorce. Do you have a reason for a divorce? And she said, oh, that, yes, a lack of communication. <laughs> But Jesus is the master communicator. And if there's a problem, it's in you. It's not in Him. If you end up feeling guilty over the next two weeks, you miss the point. These codes of character are for you. They're God's grace for you. God loves you no matter what you've done. He wants you to get better. And He's not going to leave you the way you are. Let me give you a quick definition of the word blessed. In pagan literature, it is the highest stage of happiness or togetherness enjoyed only by the gods. And the Old Testament Hebrew equivalent of this word had a congratulatory connotation to it. Or in other words, Jesus says, when he says blessed, he's saying congratulations, be happy. Congratulations, be happy. With that thought in mind, let's take a look at the first one. First of all, Jesus talks about those who are poor in spirit. Verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Or in other words, congratulations, because you're in a state of well-being if you're poor in spirit. And not only that, you get the kingdom of heaven to boot. If you're aware of the synoptic parallel of this found over in Luke, then you're aware... That it says that Jesus said, blessed are the poor without the word spirit behind it. And there's something to be said about that. I'm not taking a stand on being poor, but I want you to know that when you're poor, you're usually satisfied with what you've got. When you're poor, you're more content with the blessings you receive from God. When you're poor, you're dependent upon Him and not independent because you don't have anything to do with it. I told you many times before about the young man in Chicago. Who, his mother called me. He was a member of the youth group. He graduated high school. He didn't care anything about college or anything else. He took his savings out of the bank and he was going to go off to see America. Backpack across America. She called me to work, said, can you come up to the church and talk him out of it? I met him in the parking lot. I tried to talk him out of it. I was kind of envious, to be honest. He said to me, after I pitched my case to him, as he started to walk away with a smile on his face, he said, Mr. Lockman, everything you own, owns you. You couldn't do what I'm doing if you wanted to. Because everything you own, owns you. I want you to know he was right. And so there is a sense of congratulations in being poor and not being encumbered to the world. There is a sense of congratulations in being poor and not being enslaved by all of the stuff that you own that really owns you. As Love has said many times, I've been rich and I've been poor, and rich is a whole lot better. But I want you to know there's no moral value in being poor. And Matthew, when he completes the teaching, adds the word spirit to it, and that gives us something important to see here. He's saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. In fact, blessed are those who feel humble and helpless before the God of the universe. Because they're the ones that know where their blessings are coming from. They know they don't have anything to do with it. 
Did you hear about the man who was given a medal for being the most humble person in America? And then he was forced to give it up because he wore it? What does it mean to be poor in spirit? To realize the true order of things. That God is everything and that you are nothing. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? It means that you realize you're not God and things don't revolve around you. You realize that God is God and all things good and perfect come for Him. Poor in spirit means having the proper perspective. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? It means that you know that every day the world turns upside down on top of someone who was sitting on top of it yesterday. It means that you know that if there is help to be had any place, that it will come from God. It means that you know, contrary to American folk religion, God doesn't help those who help themselves. God helps those who cannot help themselves and who know it. And then he said, there's a future hope about it too. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Listen, heaven is not for those who earn it. It is for those who know who gives it. All right, secondly, Jesus talks about not only the poor in spirit, but He speaks of those who mourn, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. In Isaiah 61, 1b through 2, it says this, He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, and here it comes, and to comfort those who mourn. Now, you need to know that the 61st chapter of Isaiah is a Messianic chapter. And it refers to the coming of Messiah and what He will do. And so Jesus is saying here in the Beatitudes, as He's teaching His disciples, He's saying, I'm it, guys. Messiah is here. You don't have to shed tears anymore because I have come. But He meant more than that. And it's a little bit confusing, to be quite honest. How can you be joyful and happy if you're mourning? Let's take a look at it. First of all, there is a sense in which mourning defines value. You never realize the value of something until you lose it or almost lose it. It's Father's Day, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my dad this morning. I was so proud of my dad. I loved him so much before he was killed. I, I loved him even more after he was gone. He was my friend, my best friend. He was the best man at my wedding. But I want you to know that after I lost him, I loved him a whole lot more because the loss defined his value to me. You see, mourning defines value. And then secondly, mourning affirms hope. It's only the sad who are aware of joy. It's only those who lose who recognize the importance of having and it's only in mourning that one realizes that there is hope. You see, if you're hungry, it's a good indication that there's food. If you're thirsty, it's a good indication that there's water. If you're in mourning, it's a good indication that there is hope. I remember when I was in college, it was considered intellectual back in the early 70s to be an atheist, whether you were or not. It was the end thing. It was the fact. They thought they were intelligent enough not to need anybody else. God is dead. If their child died, they said, so what? If their wife left them, they said, so what? If they got cancer, they said, so what? If they lost their job or their business, they said, so what? And Jesus says right here, don't be that way. Mourn. Mourn, because in the morning I will come. In the morning, there is the reality of hope. And then thirdly, I suggest that in the morning there's a closeness to Christ that only those who mourn can really know. When I lost my dad back in 1986, um, it, it was a tragedy. It was a very large, huge tragedy for our family. But I want you to know that when it happened, Jesus was there. He hadn't been there in my life before. But he came in a powerful way. In the weeks and months following, God drew me to Himself. And there was a closeness our family felt to each other and to God that we had never known before. I remember growing up that I didn't enjoy being sick and staying home from school. But in a way, I didn't mind it either because of the loving attention of 
of my mother. She took care of me, waited on me hand and foot. Jesus said, I haven't come for the well people. They don't need a doctor. I've come for the sick. And there's a sense when you're mourning a great loss in your life that Jesus is more real than at any other time. So congratulations. Not because you've lost your spouse or your child, your brother, your sister, your father, your friend, your job, your business. But congratulations because as you go through this time of deep darkness, you will sense the reality of Jesus in a way that you have never known Him before. All right, thirdly, Jesus speaks about those who are poor in spirit, about those who mourn. And thirdly, He talks about those who are meek. Verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, by meek, Jesus does not mean mealy mouth. He doesn't mean wimp. One of my pet peeves is people who stereotype Christians as wimps. Jesus didn't say, blessed are the wimps. Listen. The Greek word used for meek is the same word used for the sensitivity of a horse to the bridle and the bit of the rider. Let me say it again because it defines meek. The word meek is the same word used for the sensitivity of a horse to the bridle and the bit of the rider. In other words, if the rider pulls to the right, the horse goes right quickly. If he pulls to the left, the horse goes left quickly. And so it means here a God-controlled life. A person who is in submission to the God of the universe. I heard an interview with Billy Graham one time. It was right after a crusade. The interviewer asked him, Reverend Graham, what is the reason for the continued success and longevity of your ministry? To which Dr. Graham replied, I've always listened for God to speak in my life. And then I did what he said. That's understanding that the most important thing you can do in your life is to be sensitive to the bridle of God. Let me say it again. The most important thing you can do in your life is to be sensitive to the bridle of God. The meek shall inherit the earth. Why? Because they're doing what God told us to do. The best, happiest way to live is to find out what God wants you to do and to do it. You know who makes the best leaders? those who know how to serve. It's true. The world says if it feels good, do it. Take care of number one. We're the now generation. It rewards those who will do anything to get what they want. But Jesus says the self-discipline and self-control will rule the earth. Jesus says to be sensitive to the bridle of God. When God pulls to the left, go left quickly. When God pulls to the right, go right quickly. And someday, he says, you will hold the reins to the bridle. All right, fourthly and finally, very quickly for this morning, we'll finish up next week. Jesus addresses those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek. And last of all for this morning, he addresses those who want to be good. Verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. H.G. Wells talked about people who are very bad musicians, but have a tremendous passion for music. My dad was one of those. I remember going to church with my dad, standing up on the pew as a little boy, and him standing on the floor, him holding one side of the hymn book and me holding the other. And singing the hymns, and sometimes it got downright painful because he couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. But he loved music. He listened to all kinds of music. Symphony music, classical music, country and western music. And he always had the best stereo system that money could buy. He sold them, but he also had them. I remember when I moved out after college, and uh, he made my little room upstairs into a music room. He had speakers in there that were bigger than pieces of furniture. He had the best stereo that you could buy. At one time he had a Macintosh, which was the best in the world. But he couldn't carry a tune in the bucket or play an instrument. He had a passion for music, but he was a horrible musician. I want you to know I'm like that. I have a passion for goodness, 
but I'm not very good. And that's why I so desperately need God's grace. I went to a wedding one time. I got into a discussion about religion with a bunch of unbelievers. Before we finished, an attractive young woman came up to me, vividly tipsy from the effects of her champagne. And she said, you know all this stuff you've been talking about? I don't believe a word of it is true. And I looked at her and I smiled and I replied, no, but don't you wish it was? Don't you wish it was? Because your champagne will wear off tomorrow. And I'll still have Jesus. Let me tell you, I'm not good, but I wish I could be. I'm not righteous, but I'd give anything in the world to be righteous. I'm not pure, but I wish, but I wish I could be pure. You know, at night, when I blush from what I've done during the day, I wish I could be different. I wish I could change. I, I wish that I could really be righteous. Don't you grow tired of confessing the same sin over and over again to the Father? I do. Do you bless in private and say, how in the world could I have done that again? I wish I could be different. Jesus says, congratulations. God's Spirit is inside of you. And that is what is giving you the desire to be good. And not only that, but Sunday, you're going to make it. I'm so glad Jesus didn't say, blessed are because I wouldn't have fit. It wouldn't have had anything to do with me. But I am glad that He did say, blessed are those who are really hungry and thirsty for righteousness. And that's what the Greek means. Back in Egypt during the days of the Pharaohs, they would have banquets that would last for days. He would invite all of his friends and important guests, and there would be many, many tables set up in a banquet room, and they would eat and drink. On the last day of the banquet, in the morning, the Pharaoh would bring out a corpse, a dead person, on a table. And he would roll it up and down the aisles in front of the people sitting at the banquet tables. And as they looked at this dead body, this corpse, he would say, gaze here, eat, drink, and be merry. For when you die, so shall you be. God didn't do that. God brings Jesus out. Walks him up and down the aisles in front of our tables. And he says, gaze here. Rejoice and be happy and serve with all of your heart. Because when you die, so shall you be. Let me finish with this. Last week, the heart of our nation was broken by the killing of nine innocent people at a church in Charleston, South Carolina. These are the faces of those people. You can put a face with the tragedy this morning. These are them. A 21-year-old gunman entered a Bible study, welcomed into the Bible study, and sat down. And after sitting in their Bible study for 45 minutes, he stood up and brutally murdered nine of the 12 people in the room. I saw on last night's news that churches in Indianapolis and Louisville were beefing up their security this morning. They're placing armed undercover officers in their congregations. They're even placing armed uniformed officers at their front doors. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I got just one question. 
What in hell is going on? Because that's where all of this is coming from. From the pit of hell. It's a supernatural battle between evil and good. Racial hatred. Can you believe that? In 2015, a 21-year-old? Do you know it was in 1963 that Martin Luther King marched on Selma and gave that speech, I have a dream? That was 52 years ago. And look where we are today. Racial hatred. Evil is what motivated that young man to kill nine innocent people. And if it wasn't for the fact that he was going to be locked away for the rest of his life, he would probably take a wife, have children, and 20 years from now, he would be raising a whole new generation filled with the same hatred and ignorance. So what can we take away from the events of this week? What can we, as individuals... Americans, brothers and sisters and followers of Christ, what can we do? Well, let me be very, very blunt this morning. We can change who we are in this community. Don't you ever refer to the big hill out past Corbin by the name that the idiots and morons gave it over a century ago. Don't you dare. Don't you ever allow a racial slur or joke or comment come out of your mouth ever again. Don't you ever look at someone who has different colored skin than you do in a degrading or inferior way. Don't you ever look down on or criticize a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Hindu or someone who has different religious beliefs than you have. And don't you ever hold contempt or hatred in your heart for gays or lesbians or the sexually confused. Because when you do any of those things, you are perpetuating the hatred that's responsible for killing nine people in Charleston, South Carolina this week. When you do any of those things, you are pouring gasoline on the fire of ignorance that has burned far too long in this great country of ours. Jesus didn't say, they'll know you're my disciples because of your hatred and your discrimination and your intolerance and your indifference. He said, they'll know that you belong to me because of your love. They'll know your mind because you love so uniquely and unconditionally and totally. Now let's be perfectly honest this morning. There is no sin of which you are not capable. And there is no sin of which I am not capable. And whenever we begin to think there is, when we look down our arrogant nose and we judge others and we say, they're worse than I am, I would never do that. We're only setting ourselves up for the biggest fall of our life. Love and unity and brotherhood and acceptance has to start with us, the church of Jesus Christ. If not, who's it going to start with? Jesus came into this world to save us and to die in our place. But folks, He came primarily to love us. Unconditionally. No matter what. So that with His love, we could love others. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we lift up the victims of the shooting down in Charleston too this morning and their families. And God, I'm so thankful and grateful that all nine of them were believers and that their families were church people, your people, they were believers. I couldn't believe what I was hearing when the bond hearing came. And a representative from each of the nine families went and said to that young man, I forgive you. I forgive you. One after the other. Nine families. I forgive you. That's the kind of love that has to meet face on the hatred that we saw last week. That's the only thing 
in this world that's going to change it is the love that you gave us on the cross on Calvary through Jesus Christ. With that love and other supernatural weapons that you've given us, the Word of God and prayer, we can fight this battle. The battle's already been won on the cross. We just have to stand and stand firm. God, take our prejudices away. Let us be cycle breakers. Don't let us breed another generation of prejudice, prejudice and racial hatred. Let us crucify it. Put it on the altar. It has no place in the kingdom of God. We pray for those families this morning. We pray for that whole community. We pray for our country. That you would heal us. And that you would change us.